Okay. Okay. So welcome to the last session of the workshop. The first talk is about Delphi. So that's a Greek name. Uh, it's about cryptographic inference for neural nets. Uh, and Pratush is going to actually deliver the talk. So please go ahead. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Tantigoni. Hi, everyone. I'm Pratush, and I'll be presenting Delphi, which is a system for secure inference on neural networks. This is a joint work with my excellent co-authors, Ryan, Akshay, Venting, and Raluca. OK, so what's secure inference? So in the problem of secure inference, uh, a server has some machine learning model M, and a client has some private input X. And the client wants to obtain the prediction of M on this input X. But, and the goal is that the client and server should learn only the prediction. Um, in particular, the server shouldn't learn any information, any other information about the client's input, and the client should not learn any other information about the server's model M, except for what is revealed by the prediction. Okay. So let's take a look at some what some prior work on secure inference looks like. So the earliest class of protocols are those based on fully homomorphic encryption. In these protocols, um, uh, yeah, they rely on uh, fully homomorphic encryption to homomorphically evaluate the neural network over the uh, over the client's encrypted input. And because FHE is such a heavyweight tool, these achieve performance that's you know, uh, quite far from native execution. And also, they're not able to support a wide class of neural networks because only some operations are efficient in FHE. Okay. So to improve upon this, people have developed two PC-based solutions, which are secure MF and state-of-the-art gazelle. And these improve definitely in terms of the class of networks that they support and also in the performance, but the gap from native execution is still quite large. So the goal, the quite ambitious one in Delphi, is to try to close this gap to support a wide class of networks while trying to minimize the, uh, the, the gap between native execution and cryptographic execution. Okay. So in more detail, what we achieve in Delphi is a system for secure inference for specifically convolutional neural networks. We achieve standard semi-honest uh, simulation-based security, uh, support arbitrary convolutional neural networks, and improve greatly in both bandwidth and inference latency compared to prior state-of-the-art, even on uh, networks that are much larger than those considered in prior work. Okay. And we achieve this via a combination of uh, three kinds of techniques of cryptography, machine learning, and systems. All right, let's dive in. So just a quick recap of convolutional neural networks. These are neural networks consisting of alternating linear and nonlinear layers. Linear layers include uh, uh, convolutions and fully connected layers. And nonlinear layers include activation functions such as ReLU, which is 0 less than 0 and identity uh, greater than 0. Okay. So to evaluate the network, you just go layer by layer until you get the output. Okay. So the starting point for Delphi will be the prior state-of-the-art gazelle. And the key insight in gazelle is to use cryptography that is specialized for each kind of layer. In more detail, to um, evaluate uh, first a linear layer, uh, Gazelle uses linearly homomorphic encryption. And the idea here is that the client encrypts this input using this LHE, sends it to the server, and the server then homomorphically applies the linear layer to the encrypted input along, and then adds in a mask S. Right? It sends back then the ciphertext to the client who decrypts it and obtains uh, Y, which is the decryption of, um, yeah, of C. So it obtains LX plus S. Okay. Then, to compute the nonlinear layer, um, Gazelle uses garbled circuits because garbled circuits are very efficient for bitwise operations like ReLU. Okay. So the garbled circuit takes this input Y and the server's mask S. It undoes the mask to obtain LX and then applies the ReLU. And then there's a pre some post-processing step which uh, takes this output of the garbled circuit and outputs a new fresh ciphertext of, uh, containing ReLU of, L, uh, of LX. And this is then used to evaluate the next linear layer. Okay, and so you continue these two steps until you get to the end of the network. Okay, so Gazelle spends a lot of time optimizing each of its components, and it uh, you know there's a great improvement from prior work, but the components are still quite heavy. So they're still using cryptography in sort of the latency critical part, and furthermore, because of reliance on um, this LHE, uh, Gazelle can't take advantage of standard uh, hardware acceleration techniques such as GPU evaluation. And the garbled circuits are also quite an expensive component. So to put together, this means that uh, you know, for a moderately deep network like RESA32, each inference takes 600 megabytes of communication and 82 seconds to complete. So, and this is just in the online phase. This is the pre-processing phase also, which has its own expense. Okay. So, so to, uh, to reduce these costs, we developed new cryptographic techniques in Delphi. The first of which is to optimize the linear layer evaluation. And the idea here is to sort of try to move the heavy cryptography to an offline pre-processing phase before the client's input is available. So here the client now samples a random R, encrypts it again with the LHE, sends it to the server, 
the server applies, uh, homomorphically applies the linear layer as before and sends back the masked ciphertext to the client who decrypts it and obtains LR plus S. So this is very similar to Gazelle, except, uh, in, except instead of using the actual input X, we're using a random R. Okay, so now client and server, they store this R, Y, and S. And then in the online phase, when the client's input becomes available, right, the client sends uh, its input X masked by the random value R. Um, and the server then takes this X plus R and applies the linear layer. Uh, and now the key, key thing to notice is that um, the server and client hold the secret share of LX. So the so client has Y and the server has LX plus Y. And we can take, take advantage of this fact. Uh, we're plugging uh, these two values into the garbled circuit, right? At the garbled circuit will undo the secret share. It will recover the actual value. So it'll recover LX, it'll apply the ReLU, and then output a fresh uh, randomized uh, share for the next uh, linear layer. And then you can repeat this process as before, right? And the key thing to note here is that because um, now the online phase is operating only over native values, it's not operating over ciphertext, but just over mask native values, uh, all of these computations are GPU compatible and they can be executed on the GPU. So together these optimizations, what they allow us to do is reduce the communication almost in half and the latency down to almost 13 seconds, which is great. Okay, so this is good, but we're still not quite done because we still have this bottleneck of the garbled circuit, which is communication heavy and also requires some computation, uh, computation overhead. Okay. So the problem that we're facing is that ReLU is cheap in the CPU cost model, but it's expensive in the 2PC cost model. And uh, so a natural idea to solve this would be to replace ReLU with something which is cheap in the 2PC cost model. For example, uh, multiplication, right? So you could replace ReLUs with quadratic activations. And this is not a new idea. This isn't considered in like the earliest works in the space. But the problem is that training networks which contain these quadratic activations is quite difficult. And this is because all the algorithms that we do have for training are optimized for training all ReLU networks. Okay, so to solve this problem, we, we turn to machi uh, machine learning techniques. And what we did was we developed a, a planner for Delphi, which takes in some minimum accuracy threshold and, uh, all, and a pre-trained network which contains only ReLU activations and outputs a hybrid network which contains a mixture of ReLU activations and quadratic activations. Uh, and while ensuring that the accuracy meets the minimum threshold T. Okay. We achieve this via two kinds of techniques. First, we improve the training algorithms for, uh, and adapt them to train these hybrid networks. And then we um, take an uh, exciting new machine learning technique called neural architecture search. And what this does is, is it allows us to find optimal configurations of um, these networks, you know, where to place the quadratic activations uh, instead of doing it manually. Um, and yeah, this, I think it's a very exciting uh, technique. I'll talk about a little bit more later. Okay. Um, yeah, so to put together, uh, well, putting the whole package together, what Delphi's end-to-end -end workflow looks like is as follows. So first, the server trains its all ReLU network, and then it asks the client for the minimum accuracy that is acceptable and plugs these into the planner. The planner outputs a hybrid network, um, which is then used for the, for the cryptographic pre-processing. So the client and server engage in the pre-processing and obtain some material, which they store for later on in the online phase. Then in the online phase, when the client gets this input X, it can interact with the server uh, using the online phase to obtain the prediction M of X. And so this is the end-to-end -end pipeline for Delphi. Okay. So, okay, so I've talked a lot about the theoretical um, contributions of Delphi. Does it actually lead to practical improvements uh, in you know, concrete uh, networks. So this is where systems techniques come in. So we implemented Delphi uh, as a Rust and C++ library uh, with support for GPU acceleration. It's available online at this uh, GitHub link. And we evaluated the performance uh, along two dimensions. First, uh, the question to ask is, does Delphi's planner actually preserve accuracy? And second, does Delphi's protocol take advantage of whatever the, del of whatever the planner outputs and um, uh, allow you to perform inference in a way that reduces latency and bandwidth? Our evaluation in the talk will be over the Resnor32 network, which, on the, which is deeper than any, any network considered in the literature at that point in time, and on the moderately difficulty for 100 data cents. Okay, so in terms of planner accuracy, what we see is that um, the most efficient network that is output by our planner achieves accuracy loss of less than 2%. Um, yeah, uh, less than 2%. And it's not because the, there's some redundant uh, activations. It's, you know, if you replace them with identity functions, the accuracy will drop, as you can see in the graph, right? Um, 
And so in, and we'll, then our protocol can take advantage of this to achieve inference, which is 20x more uh, latency uh, efficient compared to uh, Gazelle and reduces bandwidth uh, by 9x. Okay. So, okay, just to summarize, um, and definitely we construct a secure inference for convolutional neural networks, which is much more efficient than prior work. We combine techniques from system script and ML. And the key takeaway, I think, of Delphi is that we can use machine learning to, uh, to make uh, PPML tasks more efficient within crypto itself. Okay, thank you. The paper is available online and so is the code. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, let me check the chat. So we have uh, time for actually one question, but you can take both of them quickly. So one, uh, so Hussein is asking, like a 13 seconds runtime was online or total? Are you counting the pre-processing time? Uh, so 13 seconds was online, not, not pre-processing. Pre-processing is basically moving the gazelle pre-processing to the offline phase. So whatever is the cost of gazelle moves to the offline phase. Uh, but the idea there is that you can do the offline phase, uh, you know, when your you know, mobile device is uh, charging overnight and connected to a good network, uh, things like that. So you can sort of amortize the offline cost, which is not possible in the online uh, setting. Okay, and one more question from Hussein. Did you try to use Gazelle with your new uh, neural net, the mixing of the ReLU? Did you try? Yes, it's not trivial to do it in Gazelle because to get fixed point computations to work, you need to do some sort of truncation on the secret shares. And it's not possible to, at least we couldn't find a way to do this truncation directly on the uh, encrypted ciphertext. Um, if there's a way to do that, then Gazelle could also benefit from that aspect of it. But uh, sort of homotopy encryption overhead would still be present uh, for Gazelle. Okay, thanks. And to, while the next speaker is setting up, you can also answer to the following question. Can okay. you give more details about the NAS procedure you're using? Yeah, so we adapted a population-based training, uh, which is available in this popular library called Raytune. Um, and basically the idea there is that you select some sort of, in, you have like a generation of um, um, networks and uh, at each step you sort of prune them and find out which is the most efficient and use them to find the next set of networks. And yeah, the details are in the paper. So you can also discuss it more offline. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Elaine Shi. She's gonna talk on uh, data oblivious algorithms for multi-calls, but I see that she has a new title, oblivious computation for free. Um, go ahead, Elaine. Elaine, you are muted. Okay, I'm very happy to virtually be here. I'd like to talk about uh, how to get oblivious computation for free. I only have time to talk about the results and you'll have to look at our papers for the constructions and proofs. Uh, I, I guess I have the same motivating example as everyone else. Uh, we want to use um, data analytics to mitigate COVID-19. The users upload their location traces and social interactions to a cloud provider. Everything's, in, everything's encrypted because the data is uh, privacy sensitive. So how can we perform computation on this encrypted data? Uh, one promising approach is to use Intel SGX um, or any secure processor. At a very high level, uh, a secure processor creates a hardware sandbox, often called an enclave. Uh, inside this enclave, there's a secret key. And with the secret key, uh, data can be decrypted and you can perform computation. However, as soon as any uh, data leaves, uh, this hardware enclave, it becomes encrypted again. So as long as the adversary cannot break this hardware sandbox, the data contents are protected. So now you may think this is a very secure solution, except that it may not be secure. Uh, the problem is that access patterns to even encrypted data can leak very sensitive information. Here by access patterns, I mean the sequence of memory addresses accessed by the program. Uh, to understand this better, uh, we can think of our motivating example. Uh, we may want to know who has been in proximity with an infected person, and this would require the algorithm to visit the vertex representing the infected person, and then visit the neighbors, and then to help neighbors, and so on. Um, in this case, the access pattern of the program can actually leak the entire graph structure. Uh, in summary, uh, it's not like if we run any algorithm inside the SGX enclave, we get security. 
uh, what we need is a class of secure algorithms called oblivious algorithms. Uh, this notion was first proposed by Goldrick and Ostrowski back in the 1980s. So what's an oblivious algorithm? And an algorithm is said to be oblivious if roughly speaking, its access pattern distribution is independent of the secret input. In other words, by looking at the access patterns, I learn nothing about the input data. So now with Intel SGX, we'd be relying on the programmer to write oblivious algorithms. And this seems like a lot to ask from the programmer. Uh, so Goldrick and Ostrovsky said, you know, it would be nice if we can have a compiler that automatically takes care of this. Uh, in other words, a compiler that can convert any algorithm or program into an oblivious counterpart. And this is commonly known as an oblivious RAM or ORAM for short. So we've studied ORAM for more than 30 years and we understand it pretty well. Uh, so first there's a log and lower bound. Uh, uh, any ORAM scheme must incur at least log and overhead. And this was shown in Goldrick and Ostrovsky's original paper. Uh, for a long time, it was not clear whether log n is attainable. Uh, in the very recent work joined with um, um, my students and collaborators, uh, we showed that indeed, you know, you can construct an optimal ORAM with log n overhead. Okay, so that's great. I mean, it took us 30 years, but we finally closed ORAM. I mean, it's log n, whether you like log n, whether you hate it, it is what it is. Uh, we can now sip a beer and rest. Uh, but of course, we don't want to stop at log n. What we really want in practice is to get obliviousness for free. In other words, we want to have oblivious algorithms without having to pay any performance penalty. So now you may object. This seems too good to be true. Didn't you just say there's a log n lower bound? So to understand uh, when and how we can overcome this log n barrier, uh, I'll clarify a couple of things about this log n lower bound. Uh, so there are two things to notice. First, the log n barrier uh, applies when we insist on having a generic compiler that can compile any program to an oblivious counterpart. In practice, uh, when we um, have a concrete computational task, we often don't have to go through this generic transformation. So we don't have to pay this uh, log n overhead. Uh, second, this log n lower bound applies to the RAM model of computation uh, it can also be extended to PRAM, uh, but RAMs and PRAMs do not reflect the architectures or programming models uh, we adopt in the real world. For these reasons, the log and lower bound is not necessarily a showstopper in practice. Uh, and the great news, which is what I want to tell you today, is that indeed we can often get obliviousness for free, specifically in realistic parallel models of computation and for a wide class of algorithms. Let me be more specific. Uh, first, uh, although you know, in crypto, we often use PRAM to express parallelism, it turns out that PRAM actually doesn't uh, best capture real world parallel architectures. In fact, the algorithms community have realized this a long time ago and they have moved on to different parallel computing models. Uh, there are arguably two main parallel architectures adopted, adopted in practice. Uh, first, companies like Google and Facebook have clusters consisting of hundreds to millions of machines. This is called the Massively Parallel Computation Model, or MPC for short. So interestingly, there's actually a name clash with uh, cryptographers MPC, and maybe that's also why cryptographers should care about the other MPC too. Okay, so now secondly, we can get parallelism with multi-core processors. For example, in this picture, we see a commercial processor with 256 cores. Multi-core processors are best captured by what's called the binary fork join model of computation, which I'll explain in, in a little bit. The great news is that in both of these realistic parallel computation models, we can often get obliviousness for free. Uh, so in this talk, I actually want to focus on the binary fork join model, but let me just quickly say a, say a few words about this uh, MPC model. We showed that any massively parallel computation algorithm can be made oblivious with no asymptotical overhead. This result appeared in uh, IPCS earlier this year. Uh, I won't have time to go into details. So now let's focus on the binary frog join model. Uh, this is actually joint work with Vijaya Ramachandran. 
in this model, we show that many algorithms can be made oblivious, uh, can be made oblivious for free. Uh, and for several computational tasks, we obtained oblivious algorithms that asymptotically outperform the best known insecure algorithms. Uh, so to help you understand, let me quickly explain the binary frog giant model. This is uh, what a multi-core processor looks like. Uh, there are multiple cars, each with a private cache, and, and all the cars uh, have a common shared memory array. So how do we program multi-core processors in practice? One common approach is to use the binary frog join model. And, and this model was actually described in the CLRS textbook. Uh, and for example, uh, this merge sort example is taken directly from the, this book. Um, essentially, we start with one thread, and then each thread can fork into two. The forking must be two-way. The fork threads must later be joined. And because the fork, the fork threads can execute at different speeds, uh, essentially the join acts as a synchronization point. Uh, in fact, many parallel programming languages provide the fork join abstraction. Here's a list, it's not exhaustive. Uh, so one natural question is why not PRAM? Uh, mainly this has to do with uh, the multi-core processors being highly asynchronous. Uh, the, mul the multiple cores proceed at different speeds due to various factors, such as OS scheduling, changing clock speeds, and other factors. Uh, if we use PRAM, then all the cores must synchronize at every PRAM step. This is an end with synchronization. It's rather expensive. Uh, it is actually possible to simulate a PRAM in the binary fork join model by forking N threads in a binary tree-like fashion in every PRAM step. But this would incur a multiplicative log N overhead. Uh, so oftentimes converting PRAMs naively to binary fork join model is not the best idea. Okay, so last but not the least, the binary fork join model has been extensively studied in the algorithms literature and there exist efficient schedulers for this model even when the number of cars may change over time, for example, due to resource sharing or due to background jobs. Uh, we looked at a suite of um, tasks fundamental to the parallel algorithms literature, including sorting, list ranking, oilator, tree contraction, connected components, and minimum spanning forests. For all of these um, tasks, we show how to get obliviousness for free in the binary fork join model. For a sub subset of them, our algorithms uh, outperform the best known insecure algorithms. Uh, so I won't have time to go into the constructions. Essentially, we combine techniques developed in two uh, previously separate lines of work, uh, the ORAM and the parallel algorithms line, lines of work. We hope that this can uh, help to create a bridge between the two communities. Uh, and please refer to our papers for details and also for additional results, which I didn't have time to cover. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. We have some time for questions. Um, there are no questions, so we just move to the next speaker. Uh, Roy, are you there? Oh, there is a there is a question, Elaine. Hold on, let me take a look. Uh, so the question is: um, Are the gains intuitively coming from? randomization and thereby avoiding worst cases. Uh, so, so indeed, uh, like, for, um, so for the sorting algorithm, uh, we, our algorithm is randomized and then most of the other algorithms um, use sorting as a building block. Uh, so for sorting, we match the state of the art in the parallel algorithms literature and the state of the art was actually deterministic. So in this case, um, uh, we actually don't know how to have a deterministic oblivious algorithm that matches the uh, uh, state of the art insecure algorithm. And that's an interesting open question. Okay, thank you, Elaine. We'll continue to the next speaker. Roy Schuster. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Now we can also see you. Okay. I'm going to stop Elaine's screen sharing. Can you see my screen? No. 
Now we do. Okay, so uh, this is a talk, this is a work with Tal Schuster, Yav, Mary, and Vitaly Shmadikov. And it starts from this age old um, observation that language is dynamic and we can try to change it and, and manipulate it to, to corrupt things. And, um, and traditionally, you know, humans, but, uh, but this time we're gonna talk about uh, corrupting outputs of machine learning models. And uh, in natural language processing, uh, words are encoded as vectors in an embedding in a in a low dimensional space and um, and an attacker could be well motivated to try to change these uh, embeddings or try to ch manipulate these vectors because these uh, encodings are used for many downstream tasks so we have many task solvers that use like embeddings that are initialized once uh, and if the attacker could control the embeddings they might be able to manipulate the outputs of these task solvers and moreover um, we can think that there is hope for such an attacker to succeed because the embeddings are learned from uh, corpora that are big and public and rich with semantic information and so uh, to be rich with semantic information they have to be um, they have to man have many human contributors um, and this is inherent. So an attacker could, so the attack surface is broad and an attacker could, uh, could hope to change the corpus and uh, maybe tweet or edit Wikipedia and therefore uh, invoke their change uh, in, the, in the embedding. Um, but uh, so this raises the question, how do, what, what does the attacker need to add to the corpus in order to make uh, a specific uh, modification in the embedding space? And uh, it's non-trivial because the embeddings are learned in a, in, a, in, in a procedure that's based on gradients and we don't completely understand it or model it. And so it's, uh, we don't, and specifically we don't know how corpus features correspond to the uh, vector distances or the, the, what ultimately becomes the, uh, the embedding space. And um, the only thing we do know about this is that um, words that are close in their vectors are close in their meaning. And so if we have uh, meaning assigned by humans and we have two words such as horrible and terrible who are, that are synonyms, so they're, the meaning that humans assign to them is, uh, is close um, is close, then they will, their vectors will be close together. Um, and Panda and Lampin are words from completely different domains, so we know that they will be far in the embedding. So that, that is what we know, but what, kind, what is that meaning that, that humans assign to words that then gets um, encoded in the, by, by these vectors? Um, so our work deals with that pretty extensively and uh, the, the short version is that there are expressions over um, statistics derived from the corpus that we call co-occurrence statistics. Co-occurrence statistics basically is uh, the collection of, um, of uh, uh, for every pair of words, how frequently they appear together. Uh, and from these statistics, we, uh, we derive expressions uh, such as pointwise mutual information, but also expressions that build on it. Um, and so they're derived directly from the corpus without any gradient based procedure. Uh, they're less easy to work with, with than the embedding distances that are low dimensional, but they still, uh, we show that the embedding distances follow them in a very strong, uh, in a very tight way. And, uh, and so this uh, paves the way for our attack and it has three stages. The first thing that the attacker does is they define what they want to do in the embedding. So they might want to introduce a new word or make two words closer, to, closer together or further apart. And uh, the second thing that happens is that the attacker derives what they want to happen in the co-occurrence space. Uh, and they do that using our, our relationship that we, uh, that we um, demonstrated. Uh, between, again, between the embedding distances and the 
distances in this, or distance expressions in this co-occurrence space, uh, of co-occurrence statistics. And then the third thing that happens is that uh, from this co-occurrence objective, we derive what changes we want to make to the corpus. And that's also non-trivial because we want to make a few changes. We want our attack to be stealthy. So uh, we, we optimize for that. Um, and now I'm going to show a couple of examples for how to use this to attack you know, downstream systems. The first example is uh, how to attack word-to-word -word translation. Uh, so this, and this word-to-word -word translation works in the following way. We have English embeddings and we have, for example, German embeddings. Uh, the word translate, word translation is basically a linear function that maps um, um, a vector from, uh, from the English embedding space to the German embedding space. And then we find the nearest neighbor and that is our translation. Uh, so all the attacker has to do if he wants ignorance to mean strength, but in German, is to make the word ignorance closer to the word strength in the English embeddings. And, uh, and because this uh, translation function is linear, then it will map all of the strength environment to, uh, to an environment around Stark. And, um, and our attacker will succeed in making ignorance mean uh, Stark. Now, uh, what's nice about that is that the attacker is oblivious to, uh, to what, what downstream language or what's the target language that, uh, the tr of the translation. So they only deal with the source language with the English embeddings and they make the word close to the English embeddings and then whatever language is, um, uh, is translated to um, the attack uh, should, uh, is likely to succeed. Um, I'm going to show another example. So consider a resume search engine of some, uh, of some that's in-house to some company or, or something like that, and a recruiter that they want an iOS software engineer. And they send that query to this search engine. So one typical thing for the search engine to do is to expand the query to a semantically similar uh, concept to the one to the concepts the one that that appear in the query so for example with ios i will if i if i'm looking for an ios software engineer i will probably also be interested in android software engineers uh, and then the second thing that happens is the search engine returns the results that match the the expanded query um, so if our attacker uh, is has a very unique name like Humpty Dumpty, and they make uh, their unique name really semantically close in the embedding to the word iOS, then now in the query expansion, our attacker's name pops up. And not only will our attacker be returned in the uh, query results, but they will also be among the first uh, uh, results because of the TF-IDF scoring that's, or weighting uh, that's uh, given to the matches. Uh, and for that, see our paper. Uh, and there is many more things in the paper. Uh, we attack an identity recognition system. We show that our attacks can evade uh, the natural mitigations. We show attacks that, um, that, or we consider attacks that can delete from the corpus and not just add, uh, and uh, black box attacks that transfer that are um, transferring across uh, either corpora or embedding methods or parameterization, et cetera. Um, yes, and that's it. Thank you very much, Roy. Do we have any questions? I don't see questions, so uh, thank you, Roy. Um, and thanks all the speakers. Antigone, do you want to conclude? Yes. Uh... So yes, we would like to thank all, all of you, like speakers and participants, uh, for making this workshop a success with a very interesting uh, program. And especially I want to thank uh, you for choosing Privacy Museum Machine Learning for your Sunday instead of going to the beach. <laughs> so you can go to the beach now. Uh, and hopefully we can meet in Santa Barbara next year and uh, have a good start for the crypto tomorrow. And uh, that's it. So it's over. The first virtual crypto PPML. Actually, it's the second one. So let's hope the third one is not virtual as well. Thank so, you. Um, thank you. So yeah, we can uh, stop the recording.